wonder whether this morning we can count the joy in every battle because we know that's where God is. Let me say that again. I wonder whether we can count the joy in every battle because we know that's where God is, where He has been and where He will be. In His mighty name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you guys take a seat and I'm going to let this this team have a little bit of a rest for a few moments. Fantastic. While you're taking a seat, before I start on what I am praying uh, will be a refreshing and in many ways a reshaping series on the Holy Spirit, I want to speak to one of our church cultures first, uh, which is that we want to be a church community where the culture of prayer is unmistakable. A place where we encourage a culture where prayer is not an optional extra, but is instead a foundational block of our journey. With this in mind, we are going to hit hit Equip Week prayed up. We're going to hit next Sunday prayed up and ready to go. Believing that it'll be a life-transforming decision. Claude and Carolyn were here two uh, years ago around this time. They're actually here for our first Equip Week. On the Sunday Claude spoke, we had 31 people give their lives to Christ for a first time. Is that the only response we get? 31 people made life-transforming decisions on that day. Many of them now are in leadership in our church, are doing things in our church, are preaching on the stage and doing things. Why? Because an evangelist came into our place, turned lives around, and we're seeing the fruit of that coming through. So starting tomorrow, and I think we've got a slide for it, have we guys? Starting tomorrow... And Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to do three days of prayer and fasting. We're going to be meeting here, 7.15 tomorrow morning, and also on the banks of the Huon River, 7.15 tomorrow morning, because we are one church, two locations. And we want to meet 7.15 here tomorrow morning and 7.15 on the banks of the Huon River. Steve will be down there. He uh, drew the short straw and he's going down there in the outside. We'll be inside in the atrium. So that's the joys you get when you're the senior pastor. Uh, And then what we're going to do is that we are, for those who can, we are going to kind of conclude that at our C3 Wednesday Uh, which starts at 12 o'clock, where we're going to worship, we're going to hear a message on the Holy Spirit from James, and then we're going to spend some time in prayer. So it's going to be a great place to to finish off that um, at our Wednesday service. So I encourage you, prayer and fast. If you've never fasted before and you want to know what it's all about, just contact us through c3h.life. We can send some stuff out through to you and you can have a little bit of a look there. The theme of this series is on the Holy Spirit and if you've been following our social media, you would have seen our very hip looking bearded dude uh, in a yellow kind of uh, top, there he is there, it's not Jimmy, Uh, with the words not weird, not weird above his head. Uh, Firstly, uh, when you see Cam Ship in the house, Cam's here today, he's welcoming, Cam does all of our social media and does an incredible job, so just encourage him with that. This might seem a little bit of a strange title to be giving to a series, but for some, their understanding and journey with the Holy Spirit has, has never got off the ground, and it kind of feels like it is a little bit weird, which is generally a label we throw around uh, in areas of our life that either we don't understand we don't value, we've had a bad experience with, or we can't control. And don't get angry with me this early on into the series, at least get to week two or week three. But the reality is, is that when we can't control something, we have a tendency to distance ourselves from it. We withdraw. Personally, I don't fully understand the Holy Spirit. And I'm okay with that. In fact, the scriptures teach us in, uh, in, in Isaiah 55, 8, that it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So guess what? I'm never going to understand everything about God and the Holy Spirit. 
But what I want you to do as we journey through this series, I want to ask that no matter your knowledge, your background, your, your upbringing, your preconceived ideas, your thoughts, or even what have been your witnessed acts, I'm going to ask you to do three things. The first is this. Ask God to help you remove any belief that is not grounded in the Word of God. I'm going to speak what comes from the Word of God. Second is this. Come with an attitude that's hungry to hear from God. Come almost like a, like a blank canvas, ready for God to paint his creation, his masterpiece upon your life. And the third is this. I want to encourage you with this. Be prepared to embrace what God has for you. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 to 2, in the message translation, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you could do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out, not from the outside in. Readily recognize what he wants for you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and he develops well-formed maturity in you. To help set the scene a little bit, uh, in a moment I'm going to share what I call the nature of the Holy Spirit. Because if we're going to get to know someone and the Holy Spirit is a person, then we need to get to know their nature. Because it's kind of like one of those things where you see someone out there and if you don't understand their nature, you look at their actions and you judge them upon their actions, not by what makes them tick underneath. We look at someone and we go, well, they're always angry. Well, we don't actually know why they're angry and what's what's put them in that position. Maybe their situation at home is such whereby they're lucky to even be alive, let alone being angry. We need to understand the nature of the Holy Spirit. What makes the Holy Spirit tick? But before we understand the nature of the Holy Spirit, I think it's important that we understand what makes us tick. And I work on the basis that there are two human, essentially two human elements that we all desire. Need and want. We need forgiveness and we want fulfilment. You see, we need forgiveness And the only true forgiveness is found in the death and resurrection and burial, uh, death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. That's what he did on the cross for us, his burial and resurrection. You you see, Jesus is the giver of life. And we know that when he died on the cross, it was for all, but was not received by all. That even some of those who were physically present looking up at the cross did not receive what Jesus did for them at that time. And the second thing is, is that we want fulfillment. And God wants you to have fulfillment. John 10.10 says, God wants you to have life and life to the fullest. Here is the challenge though. If we are not careful, we can spend our time and our energy chasing the wrong needs. We can chase the worldly needs and the desire to get physically full and you end up never truly fulfilled. Does that make sense? We can be chasing needs so much that we end up not getting filled. This is where the Holy Spirit comes in. You see, when Jesus fulfilled what was his purpose on earth, he knew that the journey, his journey was done. And so he says to his disciples, I've empowered you. I've stood beside you. I've equipped you with training. And now I'm going to send one who is going to encourage you to help bring fulfillment into your life. 
And he says in John 14, 26, the Amplified Version. I love the Amplified Version in this because it gives colour to some of the words. And it says, the comforter, counsellor, helper, intercessor, advocate, strengthener, healer, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things. And he will cause you to recall what I have told you. I've titled this message, Don't Bring It Up. Don't Bring It Up. And Pastor Robert Morris once wrote a book called The God I Never Knew. It's a fascinating book. And in it he said this, As a kid growing up in church, leaders treated the Holy Spirit like the crazy uncle that showed up once a while. The crazy uncle that horrified everybody with his inappropriate behaviour and then as quick as he was there, he was gone again. If you've got your Bibles, I'm going to turn, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Again, I'm using the amplified version on this. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing violent wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They, there appeared to them tongues resembling fire which were being distributed among them and they rested on each other, it rested on each one of them as each person received the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled that is diffused throughout their being with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues, different languages. And as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out clearly and appropriately. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout and God-fearing men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound was heard, a crowd gathered and they were bewildered. See, often our perception of the Holy Spirit is of this floating substance that is uncontrollable and is measured only by the public outworkings that we read in Acts chapter 2. And I understand why those who were standing around that first time at Pentecost were bewildered. So would have I been. If you have never seen it before and you're walking in and all of a sudden you're standing around and all of these people are starting to speak in other languages that weren't their own and you didn't understand about this, I can, I can, I can get why they were bewildered. But you see, what we do is that we measure the Holy Spirit by the public outworkings, like radical healings and deliverance, uncontrollable laughter, speaking in tongues, People hitting the floor. I was raised in a home that believed, that were God-centered. And I understood about the fall of man. I understood that we were all sinners and that by accepting the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus and accepting Christ into my life, that I would receive eternal life. I am entirely grateful for my upbringing of my parents and the churches that I attended as I was growing up. But as a teenager and growing into my early 20s, I don't remember a series ever being taught on the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that is mentioned in the Bible over 800 times. And generally, if there was some sort of teaching in the book of Acts, or if there was some conversation in our connect groups or, or whether, whatever it focused around the passage, my understanding was so limited that I would just focus on what the outworkings were. So much so that I remember in my youth days, I had no understanding. So me and my mates would just kind of hear something or read something in the Bible and just start trying to talk in tongues and talk gibberish to each other because we didn't have an understanding of what it was. You know, we weren't being arrogant. We were simply ignorant. Because the point is this, is if ever we raised it, we were told, don't bring it up. Now, I don't hold any grudges against my, uh, the churches I went to when I was a kid. Not at all. Because what it helped form in my life 
was to meet ignorance with openness. To meet people where they're at. To understand that not everybody is going to be on the same page. To not try and force something upon people. Because when you force something upon people, they feel like they're out of control and they will withdraw from that. And it's not for us to force upon people. We're actually first introduced to the Holy Spirit way back in Genesis 1 verse 2. And it says, The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In the Old Testament Hebrew, the translation for spirit was ruach. I did five years in the Middle East, so I can speak a little bit of the Arabic, but it was ruach. Our Dutchies will get that well. And ruach actually means a wind, an energy, a blast of breath. And so let's reread Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, with the translation of what ruach actually means. And it says, The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the earth. And listen to this and the breath of God, and the breath of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Think about this. Out of the mouth of God came the breath of life. That's what the word spirit means in the Old Testament. Out of the mouth of God spewed the breath of life. So let's switch to the New Testament Greek. The word spirit is pneuma. And I'm not pronouncing that right. Pneuma. But it roughly means the same, to breathe, wind, to blow. So again, let's give it some context. In John's Gospel, we read that Jesus is preaching in the synagogue and even some of his own believers are getting offended at his preaching. Jesus knew they were outraged and he said to them, The Holy Spirit is the one who gives you life. That which is of the natural realm is of no help. The words I speak to you are spirit and life, but there are still some of you who won't believe. So let's reread it now with the translation of what pneuma means, the Holy Spirit means. Verse 63, The breath of God is the one who gives you life. That which which is of the natural realm is of no help. The words I speak to you are the breath of life, but there's still some of you who won't believe. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the very nature of the Holy Spirit. We're teaching a little bit today. Is that okay? We're going to teach a little bit today because it's important that we understand this. And I can get up and preach each week, but it's important that as a church, we start understanding the nature of the Holy Spirit so that as a church, we don't withdraw. As a church, we don't try and smash it on people, but we allow people to understand so that we can receive. If we're going to accept that the word spirit is to breathe or is energy or is the wind. I want to give you four natures of what I see of the Holy Spirit. The first is this. Wind is unseen. Wind is unseen. And Jesus is speaking to his disciples again in John chapter 14, 16 to 17. We're using a lot of scriptures because I said to you, it's got to be grounded in what the Word of God says. Wind is unseen. John chapter 14. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another Saviour, the Holy Spirit of truth, who will be to you a friend just like me. And he will never leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him. They don't know him. They can't control him. He doesn't fulfill them. So they won't receive him. But you will know him intimately. Because he will make his home in you and will live inside of you. So for Jesus, this was a time when he was telling his disciples, it's time to tag in the Holy Spirit. I've done my job. I'm tag teaming in the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of, I find it interesting. This passage, Jesus' disciples were even kind of offended by Jesus. You see, Jesus did weird things, right? Jesus, in the natural, did weird things. He went up to people 
He spat on the ground, made some mud and put it in their eyes. That's weird. But they could see it. The disciples could see it and they were comfortable with Jesus because they could see it in the natural. Jesus says, I am going, but I'm going to tag team in one who will never leave you. You don't know him. You can't see him. But he will be your counsellor, your advocate, your helper, your friend. And if we go back to that self-mentality that I talked about earlier, we like to control things and this involves our relationships. And it involves our, includes our relationship with God. You see, often we would rather be a sailboat sitting in the dock of a harbour, looking pristine and not risking any strange winds that might come across our bows. Yet as was famously quoted in 1928, a ship is safe in the harbour, but that's not what ships are built for. And so it is with the wind of God. The wind is unseen, but the wind is God's breath. And it is not for us to control, yet it is for our benefit. You see, it's the power of the wind that brings the majesty of a sailboat as it goes out. The second thing is this, is wind is unpredictable. The reason we associate the Holy Spirit with weirdness is not because of the wind itself, but the unpredictable effects of what the wind does. I spoke last week that we are creatures of habit. And the unpredictable nature of anything makes us feel very uncomfortable. And our natural inclination is if we don't understand, we withdraw. And so we just declare it, it must be weird. Pastor Chris Hodges says this, God doesn't work to our order and our understanding because if he did, we would start worshipping ourselves and forget that it was actually from God. Now this is where our Sunday services and the Holy Spirit get a little bit confusing. Firstly, in the passage I read in Acts, it does not say, and the believers were into their third song, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit descended upon them. It does not say in Acts chapter 2, and all of a sudden the keyboard player hit some emotional B flat, and the Holy Spirit came down upon them. We do know that worship music creates an atmosphere. But the Spirit of God is not just available in the third song that we sing on a Sunday morning. You carry it with you in the car. You carry it with you when you are sitting having, having breakfast with your kids. It is available when you get a welcome at the front door. When you come in here, when you sign your kids in. And it doesn't go at the 20 minute mark when the band sits down. You see, what we've done in a church world is we've placed a predictability upon the Holy Spirit. And wind is unpredictable. John 3, 8 says this, The wind will blow wherever it wants to blow, people. You don't go home and go, well, I'm going to put my washing this way or I'm going to start a fire. How many times do you sit around a campfire and you move chairs 15 times because the wind is unpredictable? The wind will blow wherever it wants to blow, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. If we flick back to the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, we read about Moses tending his father-in-law's sheep, just doing his thing, predictability 101. When the angel of the Lord appears to him in a burning bush that wasn't burning up. That's weird. And what we would do probably today is grab a fire extinguisher and try and put it out. And then we'd go, God, were you speaking to me? You see, the, whole, the unpredictable nature of God is that he may be talking to you when you're driving in your car in the morning, not just during the third song. 
The unpredictable nature of the Spirit moving through you is that He might be talking to you at your very worst time, not just when the keyboard player plays an emotional B flat. Yet we've become so predictable in our mindset that we've boxed God in as to when the Spirit can speak to us. You can only speak to me at this period of time. Structures and systems are important in church. But the willingness to receive the unpredictability of God, and in particular what the Holy Spirit is doing, is what I believe will springboard revivals across this nation. The third thing is this. Wind is powerful. I'll get the guys up. Thanks, Tom. Wind is powerful. Wind is powerful. Have you ever been caught in a windstorm? Wind is powerful. And we like power. Or more importantly, we like to be in control of the power. But Jesus says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And many of you are maybe going through situations right now that human power cannot fix. And God help us if we become a society that is okay accepting what we can fix and leaving God out. But you see, this is where the, the outworkings of the Holy Spirit have been construed in awful ways. And of course, confusion and hurt and as a result that we have distanced ourselves from what the Holy Spirit is. Not because it was wrong, but because we saw power in the wrong places. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I am hungry for this power. I am hungry for this power. As I read the Scriptures, I saw bumbling, untrained disciples receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, they turned the world upside down. So I'm hungry. God, pour your Spirit upon this humble, bumbling, untrained disciple. And the fourth one is this. Come Holy Spirit. Fourth one is this. Wind is refreshing. The Spirit of God is refreshing. John 14, 25 to 26 says this, I'm telling you these things while I'm still living with you. The friend, the helper, the comforter, the healer, the advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send at my request will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all the things I have told you. I am leaving you well and whole. This is my parting gift to you. I remember getting off the plane in May 2007 for the first time in Doha, Qatar. It was 46 degrees. And as I got off the plane and hit the tarmac, I was hit by the wind. And it was like Morella had put a hairdryer on three right in my face. And there was nothing refreshing about that at all. It was uncomfortable. And we can place ourselves in situations where the wind feels hot and dry and uncomfortable when the Spirit is about a refreshing wind. You see, relationships can become stale and weird. And when we attempt to work out the motives behind without understanding the person, the wind will just feel dry. The wind will just feel like it hits you in the face. 
See, the, the person of the Holy Spirit is seen as weird because we don't bask and we don't stop to bask in the refreshing wind that comes. Paul said to the people of Ephesus, don't grieve God. Don't break His heart. His Holy Spirit, the moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life. It is refreshing. Don't take a gift for granted. As a paramedic, I, I estimated that I attended over 1,200 cardiac arrests. And as you'll know from any first aid training, the breath of life is so important. But here's a really basic training course for you in first aid. A comes before B. You see, if your airway is not clear, if your heart is not clear, you can't receive the breath of life. No matter how much I could push down on a ventilator, if the airway, if the passage in is blocked, you will not receive the breath of life. You can't receive the B before you've cleared the A. And I want to tell you that for many, we're gasping for the refreshing wind of the Holy Spirit to move through us. But the passage is blocked. There's a blockage. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing in a moment, Come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. Fall anew on me. That refreshing breath of God. But I believe that there are some who need to go. I received the Holy Spirit once, yet, yet I have blockages through and I just, want to, I just want to clear those blockages in my life, whatever they might be. I'm going to encourage you today. This is what we're going to do today. This is between you and God. This is about saying, God, I want to receive what you've gifted to me. I want to receive what you have gifted to me. And so just as we sing this song, come Holy Spirit. If you're going to sing the words, come Holy Spirit, sometimes we need to make the actions and say, well, actually, come Holy Spirit upon me. I believe there is church leaders in here where the, the, the breath of God has become stale. It's not refreshing at all. That the blockages are such, maybe in relationships with others, maybe in your walk with God, that you're putting on a face and you're, you're wanting the breath of life to come in, but there's a blockage happening in the airway. As we sing this, come Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you, just receive, just receive. Just come forward onto the altar. It is not a place of condemnation and judgment. It is a miracle moment between you and God. So I'm just going to encourage, as we sing this, come Holy Spirit. If you want to receive that Holy Spirit, what we've just talked about, the very nature of what God did with the Holy Spirit, then just come forward and just say, God, I want to clear that blockage. I want to clear that staleness. I want to receive that refreshing wind that will blow, that is unseen, that is unpredictable, but I know that it is of you. Come Holy Spirit.